Hello, my name is Timothy. This is Bible Time with Tim. And today we're going to be talking about idolatry. And uh, for this part one of this lesson, we're going to be talking about worship of other gods. Gods with a little g. I'm going to be reading from Genesis chapter 5, verses 19 through 23. And reading from the NIV, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Moving on to verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, idolatry, when you take the word idolatry and break it down, <clears throat> basically just means the worship of a false god or a false deity. I'm going to read again, idolatry is spoken of in the Bible, in Exodus. And Exodus actually gives us a little bit more detail as to what idolatry is. In Exodus chapter 20, beginning with verse 1 on through verse 6, it says, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So we talked about idolatry and from Galatians, but in uh, Exodus, it talks about idolatry and it goes into, uh, to, into a little bit more detail. In Exodus, if you remember, the passage that I'm reading from is called the Ten Commandments. And the first two commandments deal with idolatry. The first one is don't worship other gods. And the other one is don't make a God. No graven images. And both of these are important because in a person, like I said, a lot of people, they like to sort of uh, look for loopholes and they might be thinking to themselves, well, the Bible says don't worship other gods, but what if I make a, a god an idol for somebody else to worship? Well, the Bible is telling you don't even make a god. Don't make something that is intended to be worshipped. And another reason why the, both of these commandments are necessary is because 
not every pagan god, not every false god, was really associated with idol worship. For example, the Egyptians worshiped the sun. Well, if you look up into the sky, the sun isn't exactly an idol that's made by hands. Therefore, um, a person might look at this and say, well, it says don't make a god, but it doesn't say don't worship other gods. No, the Bible is very clear. Don't worship any other gods and don't make something that's intended to be worshiped. And when we look in the modern world, we find various examples of several false gods today. Now, I'm not going to try to cover every one of them, but I'm going to try to cover some of the ones that are a little bit most commonly known. And one is known as Hinduism. And in Hinduism, there is uh, many, many gods that are worshipped. There's like gods for creation, gods for destruction, gods that do all these other things. In Hinduism, there's the belief that there's many deities um, and that these deities are made to either create something, maintain something, or destroy something. And, God, and the Lord God says, is you're going to be my people, you cannot worship any of these other gods. The other form of uh, belief system is known as pantheism. In pantheism, some people characterize pantheism as sort of like a branch of Hinduism, but not all pantheists are necessarily Hindus just like not all Hindus are necessarily pantheists. But in pantheists, they believe that the universe is God. And this is kind of interesting because it suggests that everything is a part of God. Therefore, according to pantheist thinking, a person can go around saying, I am God, I am God, and pantheists believe it because they believe that that person is actually saying or meaning, I am a part of God. This is very different from the Christian concept of God because in the Christian concept, the God, uh, the Lord God, is actually bigger than the universe. In other words, the universe itself is not God. Everything that we can see in the entire physical world that is not God. God is a person who actually created the universe. The word for it is transcendent. God is transcendent. He is greater than the entire cosmos or universe, the entire physical universe. And then there's another belief system about God that's real popular, and that's Buddhism. And in Buddhism, the, many Buddhists believe that there, some Buddhists believe that there is no God, others will believe that there is a God. But in Buddhism, really the God that they kind of worship is a sort of a concept called enlightenment. It's having a certain specific type of special knowledge. But then there is another branch of Buddhism that's very common where they actually worship Buddha. Buddha is the name of the person who started Buddhism and many of them worship their, um, their paint, this uh, person and you'll actually see little shrines and little idols of Buddha around. And one of the more common ones that's talked about a lot more these days is Islam. Now, Islam is probably closer to Christianity than any of these other religions because in Islam there is one deity or one God. 
just like the Christians believe there is only one God. And also, Muslims do not believe in idols. They don't believe in the manufacture of uh, gods the way that many of the Hindus believe. Um, in, um, however, if you study it closely, you'll notice that the, the God of Islam, he doesn't always follow his own laws. And I've often thought that was funny. It's like, hmm, you've got this uh, deity um, in Islam who's given all these laws and commandments to the people to follow, but yet he doesn't seem to always follow these rules himself. One of the things that um, I was reading about, uh, I was remember one time I spent some time going over into the library and I wanted to learn about other religions besides uh, the ones, the one that I grew up on, Christianity, and I had also had some experience in atheism too. But I wanted to learn about some other religions and try to, just for curiosity's sake, um, understand it a little bit more. And um, so I decided to read the Quran. And so I went to the library and uh, picked out a copy of the Quran and I started reading it. Well, I was having, first of all, a hard time understanding what it was even saying. Apparently I had gotten some sort of bad translation. But aside from that, as I was reading, I noticed that there uh, for some unexplained reason, I started feeling weak. I couldn't understand what was making me feel weak. And I was thinking to myself, why do I feel weak? Why is it that I, after I've been here in the library, I'm beginning to feel weak? I be began wondering, at, am I sick? So I, I lifted my head to my hand to my forehead. I'm like, is there some sort of fever going on? And it was like, no, I'm not sick. And I began thinking, am I hungry? Is this why I'm feeling weak? And I thought to myself, after a while, I was like, well, that's kind of ridiculous. I just ate a half hour ago. I can't possibly be hungry. So um, after I actually uh, thought about it for a while, I began to realize that I was beginning to feel weak because I was actually reading the Quran. And it seemed like the more that I had been reading the Quran, the weaker I began to feel. It almost felt like about three people had sock, had hit me in the stomach at the same time and knocked the wind out of me, except that I wasn't gasping for breath and I wasn't feeling pain in my abdomen. It was that kind of weakness. Um, whenever we uh, deal with these uh, false deities uh, and talk about them, it's important to understand where they come from. I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 14 and then I'm going to skip down to verses 19 through 20 reading in the NIV. Therefore my dear friends flee from idolatry. Do I mean that food sacrificed to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. And after I thought about it, I began to realize that as I was reading the Quran, I was unwittingly having a spiritual encounter with an actual demon, which would explain why I was feeling weak like that. The truth is there is only one true God, and that is the Lord God. And the pagan gods of this world are actually demons. There is one more uh, false religion that I do want to talk about that's very important, and that is atheism. A lot of people who are professing atheists will argue and say, atheism isn't a religion, but I kind of beg to differ. When we say Christianity is a religion, okay, what we're saying is by Christianity is that certain aspects of the Christian 
faith are actually taken by faith. For example, um, one of them is that there is a God, okay? And that's something that I can't necessarily physically prove. It's not like I can do a video camera on God and say, hey, I know there's a God. Look, look at this video camera. I'm, it shows God right here. This is what God looks like. But even though I can't prove that there's a God, at the same time, the atheist can't prove that there isn't one. Because the atheist can say, well, there isn't a God. I've never seen God. And it's like, well, maybe God's invisible. And they might say, well, there isn't a God because he isn't, you know, you, you can't find him on the earth. And it's like, well, maybe he's not on earth. Maybe he's someplace else. There's always that sort of catch-22 where it's sort of impossible to really prove without any uh, concrete doubt that there is or isn't a God. And so because of that, I consider atheism to be a faith, a faith that there is no God. But ironically, even though atheism doesn't profess that there is a God, we find that atheism has very many God substitutes. For example, there are actually several different branches of atheism. One of the more common branches of atheism is also known as communism. In communism, the highest power that exists is the government. And so, in atheism, the government actually becomes a, becomes a god. And uh, the government now tells these people what they can and cannot do and where they can and cannot go and what they can and cannot possess. Another form of atheism is humanism. Which suggests that man becomes God. Oh, we may, we may be weak creatures now, but you know, one day we're going to unlock all the secrets of the universe. We're going to find ways to live forever, you know, and we are going to become more and more powerful and we will become like God himself. That's sort of the humanistic type of approach. And here's another approach that a lot of people who are atheists actually believe, and that is that extraterrestrials or aliens are God. And even some famous um, scientists and famous atheists have uh, gone out of their way and started, get, got the government spending billions of dollars to put all these little, these really big um, disks up there, these telescopes, they're, they're going to listen to the radio waves, and if they listen long and hard enough, they will find these extraterrestrials, these aliens out there. And these extraterrestrials will come to our planet, and they will try to find, and they will tell us how we can live and what the meaning of life really is. And so even though people who believe in all of these are professing atheists, to, some, to them there is some sort of supreme being or some sort of supreme higher power, and that higher power or supreme power usually takes a different form depending on which one that is that uh, they believe in. I remember uh, back in my younger years, <clears throat> I used to actually be atheistic myself and um, for a, at one time you know I can 
understand everything that was going on in my life. Um, my mother had died of cancer at a really bad time in my life when I'm supposed to be, you know, just starting my life. Um, she died when I was 19 and I couldn't understand, you know, what's going on and everything. And I felt like I needed to find a reason for why my mother had to die. And nothing that I thought about really made any sense because after all, if God is up there and if he cares about people, then shouldn't there be some sort of direction that our lives are heading towards? It would seem to make sense. But I could not find any solution. After, and um, eventually I wandered away from God and decided that I wasn't going to believe in God anymore. It's like, God doesn't seem to be doing much for me, so why should I do something for God? You know, why should I live for God if he's not going to help me any? Um, and I remember that um, I was... Um, working two jobs and I was working really really busy busy life but I also remember that it was a pretty hollow life because there was no real purpose to where my life was going um, I was basically uh, just living for the moment because it seemed like nothing else was working I had first at one time I had pursued you know knowledge and thought that that would be the solution but the more I learned the sadder I got because I began to realize more and more that I couldn't take it with me you know once I died that was supposed to be it everything there was to me uh, my life and eventually I'd be forgotten and nobody would know who I was and then after a while I decided well if I can't take it with me and if all there is is sadness I can't there's no hope of any type of afterlife or anything. I might as well just live for the moment, just live for some pleasure. But after a while, I began to realize more and more that all I was doing was faking it. I was sort of lying to myself, trying to deceive myself, make myself believe I was happy when I really wasn't. When I was working one time I, over in um, a burger uh, fast food restaurant, I met this new woman who started working there. And um, this woman's name um, is Amy, and she actually had a loving joy about her. It was this really incontagible, I mean, very contagious happiness. She would seem to be happy, happy all the time. And she was going through a lot of really hard and difficult struggles in her life. I couldn't understand how somebody going through all those hard struggles could be so happy. And I kind of wanted what she had. Well, as it turns out, it didn't take very long for me to find out that what was going on was she had given her life to the Lord pretty recently and that she seemed to love Jesus with all of her heart. And because of that, she was actually reaching out to people and showing them love just like Jesus had shown her. You know, she was having a very difficult time, but at the same time, she was reaching out. She was showing that she cared. Um, she was being kind to people and after a while I began to uh, take a little bit more of an interest in God I began to read the Bible a little bit or listen to it on CD um, I went to church once in a while and I was sort of beginning to reconsider it and part of it was purely selfish there was part of me that just wanted to have a date but there was another part of me which really just wanted that joy that she had. That joy that seemed so, you know, that smile that she always had because I had learned that there was, you know, my understanding was there's no God and there's no purpose in life and when I die, that's gonna be the it of, that's gonna be all there is, you know, so all I get really get out of this life is just some pleasure for the moment before I eventually pass away. Well, as after a while, <clears throat> I began to, um, after I had started pursuing this, I actually started pursuing um, aim the girl a little bit less and started pursuing um, the belief in God a little bit more. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to me, although I didn't fully understand that that was the Holy Spirit that was speaking to me at that time. For a while I just thought, well, this is just a thought that's in my head and I don't know why. It's like, 
you know, one of the things that the Holy Spirit said to me was, um, I'm trying to remember it, it was from Hebrews, it says, but without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever comes to God must believe that God is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And as, after a while, and I thought to myself, I can't come out of sheer faith, that just seems impossible. But after a while, I thought about it, and um, I also began to understand that some of the arguments that I had read from some of the previous atheists, they just weren't holding water. Um, some of them were based on a concept that um, pre-assumed that uh, there was no God, and using that presumption, they would provide evidence to, <coughs> to uh, propose that God didn't exist. And it's like, hmm, you're presuming that God doesn't exist, and then you're presenting this as evidence also under the presumption that God doesn't exist. So it began, became like a circular argument. Um, it's like I have to believe it first, and then I can find proof for it. And after, a, after the Holy Spirit was dealing with me for a while, I finally got down on my knees and I said, I believe there is a God. And that was all that I said. You know, I, I didn't know for certain whether or not there was a God. I just took it by faith. I just said, I believe there is a God. Um, and, but at that moment, I realized that it was the Holy Spirit who had been dealing with me. And for a moment, the Holy Spirit also showed me what had been a little bit about what was going on in, during the time with my mother dying. He didn't show me everything, he just showed me a little snippet, and only for a moment, how God had been with me during those times when I thought that God had abandoned me. And so, after uh, this had gone on for about a week, and the Holy Spirit kept dealing with me, and kept telling me that I needed to continue to make a full profession of faith, eventually I got down on my knees. And the second time that I got down on my knees to pray, it was a Saturday morning, I remember, and it was a cold, cold December morning. Um, I got down on my knees, and the very first thing that sort of hit me was that those doubts that had been um, holding me back all this time, they were just completely gone. And I could say what was really in my heart to God without having those doubts, those uh, evil doubts that had been holding me back. And so I just made my full confession of faith. I believe there is a God. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for even me. And I believe that by faith I can accept Him as my Savior. And at that moment, my entire life changed. Suddenly, for no reason at all, I was incredibly happy. It was almost like I was walking on clouds. I felt so overwhelmed. I, I, I was like, I can't believe I just did that. And yet, at the same time, I'm so glad I did. I walked to work that Saturday morning. I, I mean, I didn't walk to work. I actually drove to work that Saturday morning. I worked, a, I was a half hour late. And yet, I wasn't afraid of getting yelled at by the boss. I was, I worked a very painful double shift from early morning to late at night. And during that whole time, I was just overwhelmed with joy. It was like I was walking on clouds. It was, I was going through all this pain and hurt, but I just didn't care because I was so full of God's joy. And I think that that's one of the things that we really need to keep in mind, is that when we do give our life to Christ, and we give it wholeheartedly, He does fill it with a purpose. And today, to be honest, I still don't understand exactly why my mother died uh, when I was 19. But at the same time, I also realized that I don't have to know. I don't have to explain every detail of my faith to believe it. There are some things I believe because God has explained them to me. But there are some things that I believe just by faith. And that's perfectly fine. And so I just wanted to close this uh, first segment and just let you all know that God loves you and I love you too. I hope you have a blessed day. Bye.